الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وسلم اجمعين اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير حد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر امور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا ايها الاخوه اقوى oh brothers and sisters i extend to you the islamic greetings and i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this from us this brief reminder so they can serve as a benefit for ourselves first and foremost and then for you all by the permission of allah jalla wa ala so the question comes up what was the dua that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to say the most what was the dua that would moist the tongue or the blessed tongue of our beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he would frequently or constantly say and this is something that we should inshallah ta'ala it should encourage us and this is something that we should want to know and many of the companions of the past they wanted to know the same answer and inshallah ta'ala we're going to find out what is that dua Allah azza wa jal he says in his book in verses 200 in surah baqar the second chapter of the quran verse 200 to 202 Allah Azza wa Jalla says A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem Fa idha qataytum manasikakum fadhkurullaha kathikrikum abaakum aw ashadd dhikra Fa minan nasi man yaqulu rabbana atina fid dunya wa ma lahu fil akhirati min khalaq Wa minhum man يقول ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار أولئك لهم نصيب مما كسبوا والله سريع الحساب In these tremendous verses Allah Jalla wa Ala he mentions that when you are done talking to the pilgrims those who are making hajj he said when you are done performing your hajj your manasik then remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ka dhikrikum aba'akum as your remembrance of your forefathers aw ashadd dhikra or with a far more memories from among mankind there are those who seek from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they say oh our lord give us in this world wa ma lahu min wa ma lahu fil akhirati min khalaq and they would not have any portion for them in the hereafter because they only think of the life of this world and this just shows us and indicate to us before i continue translating the uh we're bringing the noble translation rather of this the tremendous verses this just shows us that the life of this world isn't in all be all that there is another world and that actually you're a sensor it's med moon to actually think that the only thing that we have in front of us is this life as Allah tells us in the Quran about the people who's known as dahriyun the people who are known as the people of of time they say that only time can destroy us we live and we die and the only thing that can destroy us is time Allah refutes that concept within the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we should not believe that the life of this world is the end all in uh, the end all be all no actually there is another life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually censor those people who only think of this life and not the next life it's important that we understand that So Allah continues he said they won't have no portion for them in the hereafter. Then Allah said among the among the people there are those who say our lord give us good in this life or give us in this life that which is good and give us in the next life that which is good and save us and protect us from the fire. Allah said these are those for them they will have an allotted portion for that which they have earned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sari'un fil hisab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swift in taking account Ibn Kathir the great historian the great mufassir the great muhaddith he also was a muhaddith as well in many of the different fields the great faqih 
Ibn Kathir, he have mentioned in his tafsir of these tremendous verses. Um, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا He says here that we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he censors the one who does not, he censors or blameworthy is the one who does not ask him except for the matters of the life of this world. And he turns away from the important life. As Allah Jalla said, that indeed the home of the hereafter, that is the true life. So it's important that we don't exclude that, that we don't overlook that. So Allah censored. Because Allah says, from among mankind there are those, there is he who says, Oh our Lord, give us in this life, and they won't have no portion for them in the hereafter. Meaning they will not have, Ibn Kathir said, they will not have any portion. Nothing will be distributed to them. They don't get nothing in the hereafter. He said, He said, and also comprising this censorship of Allah Azza wa Jal and is the fleeing and to stay away from the resembling the one who was like this. So Allah Jalla wa Ala, even though he's censoring these people in this verse, he's also alarming the believers to stay away and to flee from a, a concept or a mindset like this. He says, Qala Sa'id ibn Jubir, the noble Sahaba, Sa'id ibn Jubir, or he says, Sa'id ibn Jubir, on the authority of, Ab of Abdullah ibn Abbas, the noble Sahaba Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said about this verse, he says that this was pertaining to a people from amongst the Bedouins, who they would come to the Mokif or the Mawakif, and they would say, meaning during the time of Hajj, they would come, and they would make a dua, and they would say, Allahumma ja'alhu, they would say, oh Allah, make for us, Amul Ghai, a, a, a beneficial year, a year filled with rain that, that you know, so they can crops and, and things like that can grow. And make for us a year of this. So they would ask and then they would not mention anything of the affairs of the Akira. They wouldn't worry about Jannah. They wouldn't worry about anything pertaining to the affairs of the after. They would only ask Allah to give them something in the life of this world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse pertaining to them. From among mankind, and we, we said the verse. He said, And then there came a group of people after them from the believers who says, Our Lord, give us in this world that which is good, and give us the hair of that which is good, and save us from the fire. So Allah sent down returning to them. He says, He said, And this is for this portion is the praise for the one who acts for both the dunya and the akira. This is a praise for the one who acts for both. He doesn't act for one and in an exclusion of the other, he acts for both. He says, so this dua, and this is a dua by the way, this dua, it comprises all good in the dunya and it turns away from all evil. When a person utters this dua, he or she utters this dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, our Lord give us that which is good in this life, wa fil akirati hasana, and that which is in the hereafter, good, wa kina adab and arsi wa What it does, this dua entails and it embodies and it collects all good in this life and it turns away from that which is evil. He says, for inna hasana fi dunya, for rally the good that is mentioned in this dua, in regards to the world, it entails everything that is sought after in the worldly affairs, from well-being, from safety, from nourishment, from a home of uh, tranquility, from a righteous and good, wholesome spouse, from a spacious or ample and abundant provisions, and with beneficial knowledge and righteous actions, and hania and having a good transportation. And having a beautiful praise and other than that, which is entailed, that comes from the different expressions that have been expressed from the different uh, commentaries on this verse from the different Mufassirin. He says, so automatically we should understand that when we make this dua, we are collectively saying, we're asking that good in the, 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 the home of the, of the life of this world is all good that you can imagine. Everything that a person pretty much wants in the life of this world, I'm not talking about stuff that's against or detrimental, that is, that is, that is harmful, that is non-beneficial. I'm not talking about that. Desire we base. No, I'm talking about things such as people want a nice home. And what I mean by nice home, it don't got to be leverage or anything like that, but something that brings about peace of mind, something that brings about tranquility, something that you own, something that you feel rest and comfort in. Somebody wants that shelter. That's what people want. 
Another thing, people want what? People want something to eat, good wholesome food, something to put in their bodies. People want a good transportation, a good riding beast. Huh? These are the things people want. People want a good spouse. You understand? I mean, it's not Islamic to say you don't want to be married. I mean, that's, that's wicked. It's like Omar Ibn Khattab said, if a person doesn't get married, it's, it's safe to say that this individual is what? He's either a wicked person or he's a, he's, he's a, he's a zany. That's bad bothering what it is. There's no such thing of you talking about not getting married. It's, it's, it's none of that. Now, if your lifestyle and, and, and things like that for some reason doesn't allow you or, or give you the ability to get married, then that's something different. You might have an excuse for your Lord. But chosen and, and perfectly saying that you don't want to get married, ah, I mean, celibacy is, in, is impermissible in Islam. So understanding people want a good spouse, people want good children, right? And he says that this dua is so that entails all of that goodness. So everything you can think of good, righteous knowledge, ample provision, all of that is entailed within this dua. And he says that and this, there is no contradiction between the different um, explanations or commentaries on this verse about what good is consists of when Allah as Allah says, those who say, our Lord, give us good in this world. From amongst the Mufassirin. He said, there is no contradiction. He said, because all of that can be taken from gradually what is known as the goodness in the life of this world. He says, as for the goodness in the Akira, <laughs> he said, as for the goodness in the Akira, he said that then at the highest of that, at the highest of that, at the pinnacle of that, when you want something good in the hereafter, the highest of that is entering paradise. No doubt. It's entering paradise, and it follow along with that is being safe from the extreme, uh, the extreme adversities and difficulties people are going to experience on that day. When they'll be judged, people are going to experience the harm and the half of, of, of what's going to take place. He says, And also, you want an easy facilitation of your account because the person who has an easy record, as the Prophet said, the one who has a, an account that is real easy, that's the one that's going to be successful. Not the one who has to go back and forth. Allah has to. Their account is not easy. They're going to be sitting there, huh? Going back and forth. No, it's not going to work. If you have an easy account, that's a good thing. When you have an easy record, right? He says, and, and, and other than that, from the affairs, all oh, those righteous or wholesome affairs in the Akira. He said, as for najatu min al-nar, wa yaktadi tasiru asbabu fi dunya min al-shinabi maharum wa atham, wa taraku shubahad wa haram. He said, as for the safety and the protection and seeking the protection from the fire, then what's entails is that one take on the means in the life of this world to avoid those things which are impermissible and those things which are sins and transgressions and leaving off those shubuhat, those doubts and leaving off those haram. I want to stop here for a minute. Some people always wonder why, how do others individuals go astray? And I'm, I'm, it's a simple answer. We hear all the times, even in the khutbah to Hajj, Allah Azza wa Jal, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say in the khutbah to Hajj, من يهد الله فهو what? وَمَنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُدَلَّ لَهُ Whoever Allah guides, there none can mis misguide. وَمَنْ يُؤْلِ اللَّهِ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ And whoever Allah misguides, none can guide. We hear this multiple times, even in the Quran, Allah Jalla wa'ala mentioned it in Surah Al-Zumar, He mentioned it in Surah Al-Kahf, this concept of only He is the one who can guide. So sometimes you wonder, how can a person come to a state of, of goodness and then exit that state of goodness? A person come to Islam and then leave Islam. Or a person is guided to Islam and then leave off Islam. These questions people ask. How can it happen? I'm going to tell you something. And it's clear. It's not something. It's not mathematics. It's not no world, uh, world equation. It's not something that's rocket science. It's not magic. It's clear and it's crystal. First and foremost, you have to understand there's only going to be two avenues that a person can go down that will leave them ultimately leaving off the kite. That's going to be the door of Shubuhat, doubts, no matter what form it starts. It can start small to become big. Or it can be in the form of shahawat, desires. No matter what form it starts. Do you understand? If a person is left to run rampant with either doubts. And doubts, is, doubts are more harmful than actually the shahawat. Because doubts in and of itself is eradicating the person's belief. So if you have something that is bothering you in Al-Islam. That you don't understand. Things that you don't understand. You need to make du'a as a wajal. 
You even remember the dua that Allah says, what? Rabbana la tuzik kulubana ba'da idha daytana wa habalana min ladunka rahma. You need to remember this, this dua is, is important because Allah Azza wa Jal said, Our Lord, do not cause our hearts to deviate after you have guided us to Al Islam. So you need to remember this. Also remember the dua of Ibrahim. Rabbi, O oh Allah, keep me and my offspring from shirk. Also remember the dua of Allah Azza wa Jal in the Surah Al Baqarah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, What? That they make the dua, that they ask Allah Jalla wa ala, Rabbana la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala ladina min qablina. Oh Allah, do not place a burden on us like we have placed a burden on those who came before us. Do not place a burden on us which we cannot bear. These duas are essential and they are important for you to understand how to navigate through these shubahat. You understand? Because first and foremost, we must understand that whatever is a doubt to you, in reality, isn't a doubt. Because you cannot rely on your aqal alone. You need your aqal to be in conformity to that which is actually natural, uh, is natural disposition. But when you try to rely on it and say, okay, this doesn't make sense, then know there's something faulty with your understanding and not with the text itself. And this is key things to protect you from going astray. Sometimes we go astray because what do we think? We think that it is something wrong. How can the Lord be such and such and this is going on? If the Lord really have control, how can this happen? And these thoughts happen that the Prophet Sallallahu he says in an authenticated hadith, he says what? Do not be like so-and-so that asks a question, they keep asking questions, delving in to the point shaitan comes to him and say what? Have him saying, who created Allah? Well, where do Allah exist? Whereas there is a debate amongst the moderns right now, is God a female or a male? Yeah, they talk like this. Songs out there, what if God were a woman? You know, concepts that they put out there in movies or they put out there in, 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 in music and so forth, that God is a woman or God is a man or God is... These intricate details that they go into that they think is not harmful, but it's harmful in and of itself. As Abu Bakr al-Siddiq so eloquently put it, right, Allah ta'ala anhu, who says that what? Our incomprehensiveness of the Creator is our comprehension of the Creator. Do you understand? And this is why we don't really delve back too far into Islam and how it went through many different offshoots when the philosophical movement had hit, when the Qadariyah have came about, when the Jabariyah have came about. And you don't know some of these concepts or these terms, and I'm not going into all of that, but I just want you to know this is how people delved off. It's only going to be through these two avenues. It's either going to be doubts or it's going to be desires, man. That's how a person is going to leave. And the safety and lying in that is yaqeen. Have an absolute conviction and certainty that Allah Allahu al that Allah does not break his promise, that Allah Allahu kila, that Allah is the most truthful in his speech, wa ma ahsan Allahu haditha, and Allah is the most the most beautiful one in narrating his own speech, that Allah is absolutely truthful, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah. You don't need no confirmation behind Allah. When Allah says something, you don't have to go check and say, okay, let me go verify it's a boot. You don't need none of that. That's what you need with men. You don't need that with Allah. Allah doesn't have to assert that with you. But if we don't have this understanding, this absolute conviction, as Allah Azza wa Jal said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Al-Ayah, Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, the believers are only those who, they believe in Allah, and they believe in His Masjid, and they doubt not afterwards. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That is the book, meaning this is the book, meaning the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. There is no doubt whatsoever in it. It's important that you remain away from the shubuhat because they will lead you astray. The individual was Muslim five years ago. He's no longer Muslim. It's either it was doubts or shubuhat. That was it. And it's going to fall under that whatsoever. It's important to understand it. I wanted to mention that before he goes into this next point here. He says that um, what caused him Ibn Abdul Rahman Look what he says. He says, وَقَالَ قَاسِمٍ عَبْدُ الرَّحْمَانِ That Qasim ibn Abdul Rahman, he used to say, مَنْ أَعْطِي مَا أَعْطِي قَلْبًا شَاكِرًا وَلِسَانًا ذَاكِرًا وَجَسَدًا صَابِرًا فَقَادَ أُوْتِيَ فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآكِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَكِيَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ Pay attention to these three things. He said, whoever has been given, أُعْطِيَ قَلْبًا شَاكِرًا Whoever has been given a appreciative heart, a qalb that is appreciative for the huda, for the nur, for the guidance, for the light, for the sunnah, for all of that, is appreciative. In other words, it's content. It's 
not looking, it's not wavering, it's not going here, it's not going there, it's not picking its dean from movies. Most people, if you look in America, they did a poll. Most people who believe in heaven and hell, if you do a consensus on their belief in heaven and hell, it's mixed up between Hollywood, it's mixed up between what they heard from some type of Bible school or some type of this or some type of that. Not really based off affirmative knowledge. Do you understand? Not based off absolute conviction. It's something of this or something of that. It's not absolute certainty. Do you understand? And most people live their lives like that. Based off what my forefathers was upon, what my grandma was upon, what my grandfather was upon, what my mom or, or their father was upon, etc. Most people don't have basic knowledge. For men are nasty, main eh. Allah is what Joseph from among mankind, there are those who what? There are those who speak about Allah or those who argue about Allah is what be ghairi ilmin, huh? Without any knowledge whatsoever. Right? And nor do they have a book of enlightenment, and nor do they have any huda. This is important. So he says, whoever given that contented heart, that heart that is shakiran, walisan and dakiran, because if it's the heart is shakir, if the heart is filled with shakur, that it has appreciative, then immediately and automatically and is obligatory and is compulsory that the limbs will follow and one of the main things of the limbs that will follow what's in the heart will be the tongue and the tongue will be have dhakir or it will be dhikr upon the tongue it will be dhikr upon the tongue kira'at al-Qur'an kira'at al-Hadith al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam no the adqals the ad'iyas the supplications huh the Alhamdulillah, the Allahu Akbar, the truthfulness, the dhikr what comes from that radiating heart that is content. And whoever gives a lisanum dhakiran, a tongue that is that is that is remindful. Okay? And then he says, after that, look what he says, after a tongue that is remindful, wajasadan <laughs> sabiran. And give a body that is embowed with patience. That no matter what happened to it in his life, it won't shake. It, Iman would not falter. It would not look crooked eye at Allah Azza wa Jalla. It would not go against that. It would not complain to the creation. It would be bear what it has and understand the rules of sabr. Look what he just embodied. He embodied a contented heart, a thankful tongue, and a body to have patience. Do you understand that? He dealt with all three aspects that Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah deals with the heart, the tongue, in the body limbs, right? He said, whoever is granted this in this life, then they would have incorporated this dua. If you got all three of these things, then you have goodness in this life, goodness in the hereafter, and you are safe from the fire. Do you see that? This is what Qasim ibn Abdul Rahman, he said, whoever have all three of these things, they would have embodied this actual dua, this supplication. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us these three things that mean. Now, he says, "Well, he had the word of the Sunnah be taragiba. If he had the du'ai, for Bukhari, he said, for this reason we find in the Sunnah the encouragement of saying this particular du'a. Imam Bukhari he brings a narration in the Sahih on the authority of Al Bumamar that who related to us to Abdul Warth and Abdul Aziz all the way down to Anas ibn Malik. And Anas ibn Malik, by the way, if you don't know who he is, read the Allah and who he is that companion." Who has spent a serv spent service? He was the Khadim al Rasul. He was the servant of the Prophet. His mom pinned him in the service of the Prophet for 10 years. He says, Anas ibn Malik, he says in this hadith that's in Sahih, he said, Qala kana Nabi He said that the Prophet used to say, Allahumma Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa kina adab al -na. He said that the Prophet would say, Meaning this was something that was habitual. This was something that the Prophet ﷺ, it's habitual that he would make a part of his regular dua. That he would say, oh Allah, our Lord, give us good in this life. And give us good in the hereafter. And give us good and save us and protect us from the fire. This is a dua that the Prophet ﷺ said. I ask you right now, how many of us even know this dua? Two, for those who do know it, how often do we say it? Three, for those who if we often say it, how, how much do we really actually believe? Because you won't often say anything if you don't have understanding of what you're saying. But if you understand what you're saying, then it will prompt you to say it more frequently. How many of us even know about this dua? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa kina adabin nar. Most of your problems got nothing to do with the accurate. It got something to do with this dunya. And you beg and you plead and you shout and you scream all for the dunya. I want this, I want that, like a child. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And when you don't get it, 
your iman is affected. When you don't get it, your belief is affected. When you don't get it, you come in a temper tantrum. Your patience is not there because all of it is about the dunya. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense. Something that is perishable, that's not even everlasting in the first in the first place. Something that you know from the very moment that you taste some of its pleasure that is going to be deceiving. It's not going to be pure and wholesome from the door. But yet and still, this is what you ask for most of the times. This is what preoccupies your thoughts most of the times. This is why you have to understand why the Prophet ﷺ made it what? Whoever goes to sleep and he wakes up with only but the dunya on his mind, he only going to get that which was decreed for him in the first place. And then his affairs will be shattered and poverty will be placed between his eyes because he can't see beyond what's here. Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentioned in the Quran, he said, well, he can't see behind what's here. Allah mentioned to you in the Quran about those who want the dunya as versus those who want the akhirah. Do you understand? Ya'alamun al-zahira min hayat dunya That they only know the outer aspects of the dunya. If you are a person who is aiding and striving for Islam, you don't only know the aspects of the dunya. It was the akhirah that made the companions behave the way that they behave. Their hearts traveled to the akhirah that made them forsake the dunya. You're not forsaking the dunya. You're not giving up the dunya if you don't have Allah for the akhirah. That's why Allah says, "Kalla o balla yaqafun al akhirah wa tadrun al ha." Why do you think Allah says this? Allah says, "Nay, they don't have no fear of the akhirah. Rather, they leave it off." Why do you think that? Because they ain't thinking about that. That's not what's going to prompt them. So He says here, making this dua, He said that this is something that the Prophet Sallam used to do, and He says that also. Ahmed, he had put it in his Musnad, another hadith, um, whereas it was related to Abdul Aziz ibn Suhaid. He said, I asked Qatada, right? I asked Qatada, which dua that our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yeah, this, yeah, nah. he said that Qatada asked Anas, meaning Anas ibn Malik, which dua or da'wa or dua that the Prophet ﷺ would constantly or frequently say the most. He said the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhab al nar. This is the dua that the Prophet ﷺ would say the most. This is the dua that he would say the most. He says, Wa kana anasi da arada in yadu bi da'wa ta da'abiha. That Anas, whenever he wants to supplicate, he will begin with this dua. And whenever he wants to give a dua, he will say this dua, and this actually hadith here has been collected by Muslim in his Sahih. Ibn Abi Hatim, he says about the same thing. He's mentioned that it was said to Ya'ni Abu Talut, he said, Kuntu inda Anas ibn Malik. He said, I was with Anas ibn Malik one day. Right? He says, So I said, So Thabit said to him, he said, rather your brothers, they want you to make dua for them. He said to, he said to Anas, Thabit said to Anas, he said, indeed your brothers, they want you to make dua for them. They want you to supplicate on their behalf. He says, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhab al nar. He would say this particular dua here. Oh Allah, grant us the good in this life and grant us the good in the next and save us from the fire. And then they will, they will refer or talk about the hour. He says, and they will talk about the hour. He says here, until they want to get up and stand or leave. But they will begin with that dua, that supplication. And this is something that we should learn. This is a dua and this is a divine dua. It's not a dua from the Prophet This is a dua from Allah. Allah Azza wa mentioned this in Surah Baqarah, verse 201. This is a dua here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. From one minute, Nas, when you call Rubbana at in a Fidunia, Hassana, or for Akirati Hassana, we can add that. But this is a dua that we should say. It's also mentioned that in the Sunnah, Sheikh Al Abani, he brings it. Um, it mentioned that before the Prophet was Salam will salam out, one of the duas that he will say is this dua Rubbana at in a Fidunia Hassana, or for Akirati Hassana, we can add that. But it embodies all three of those things. You ask Allah Jalla for good in this life. You ask him for good in the hereafter, and you definitely ask and seek his protection from the fire, because the fire is real. Which should tell you and I, if the Prophet ﷺ, and even if Allah keep mentioning about the fire, 
and the Prophet ﷺ keep mentioned by the fire. That one time the companions were by the grave, and the Prophet ﷺ told them to seek refuge from the grave, from the punishment of the grave three times. And he told them to seek punishment from the nar, to seek punishment from the fire three times. If he constantly keep mentioning about the fire, that should tell you what? That is true. There's one dua that the Prophet ﷺ will say when he get up, as Abdullah ibn Abbas mentioned, that the Prophet ﷺ would get up to pray the night prayer. When he get up to say the night prayer, what would he say? What would be the dua, the opening supplication that he would say? He would say what? He would say Allah. He would ask Allah that our Lord Jibreel, and Mikael, and he would say that what? What Jannah to Hakka? Your paradise is the truth. When Naru Hakka, and your fire is the truth. So if this is the understanding, then how can many of the believers today behave and act as if the fire isn't true? Tell me, how can your actions belie the concept that there is a new fire? How? Huh? Is mentioned throughout the entire Quran about the fire. The fire is mentioned. Allah actually told you something even more on top of that. Allah he described it. Allah said, On the day that we will say to the fire, on the day that the fire, we will say, Nakul Allah said on the day that we will say to the fire, to the hellfire, Allah will speak to the hellfire. Halim talati wa takul wa takulu halim talati. Halim talati wa takulu halman mazid. Allah will say, Are you for? And the fire will respond. The hellfire will say, Are there any more? I have more room. I have more room. Are there any more? How do you not believe that the fire is real? How? How? Allah Azza wa Jalla says about the believers, those who understand the value and the reality of this dunya, Allah Azza wa Jalla says about what he had prepared for them that is better than this dunya. He said, there are those الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا وَكِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Here it is again. Those are they who say, our Lord, indeed we believe. We believe in the messenger. We believe in the message. We believe in this. And forgive us of our sins because we're going to sin. La but We're going to sin. We're going to commit sins. Forgive us of our sins. Wakina adab and nar. And save us from the fire. This is what they would say. Allah Azza wa Dal talks about the Ibad al Rahman, the servants of the most merciful. Then he mentioned their qualities and their attributes. What do he say about them? He says about them. الذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما Look, he say, he tell you about this. Those who, when they come across the ignorant people, they say to them what? They address them and they say to them salams. Those who spend their nights standing up in prayer, in qiyam, in, in, in standing, as well as in sujood and prostration. Those who say, oh, our Lord, avert from us the punishment of the hellfire, of jahannam. Virality, its punishment is ever, is most gruesome and most um, gruesome. Huh? So it's always going to follow, if you look in the du'a closely, it's always going to follow with the believers, especially through the Qur'an, that they're going to seek refuge from the fire. And we make this not our center point? <laughs> One of the sellers of the past, they said, I am amazed at the son of Adam, that he said he's believing in the hellfire, but yet he does nothing to prepare for it. He said he believes in the hellfire, but he carries on as if nothing is prepared for it. This is real. This is why you don't have nothing to check your desires. You don't have nothing to check your doubts because you don't put the, forth, the fire at the forefront. But if you say this dua and you really ponder on this dua and you really reflect, you're going to seek refuge from the fire. Allah Azza wa Jal says something even more on top of that. He said, U'iddat lil kafirin. U'iddat. Here is fitlul majhul. If you know about Arabic, then this is fitlu majhul. This is telling us that here you have active and you have passive. This is passive here. Allah is telling you that the hellfire has already been prepared. It's already created. It's already there. And it has already been prepared. Meaning it already has people that's going into it. Do you understand? That's how deep it is. It already has been prepared and already have people that's going into it. We don't understand these concepts. This is why you make dua and ask Allah Jalla wa'ala from protection of it. It's important that you do this, and also it keeps you in check. Last but not least, he mentioned at the end of this, he says that there comes a tremendous dua. I want you to pay attention to this here. He says, Look at this here. He says, so it was said to me, Ya Abba Hamza, his kunya. 
talking about Anas ibn Malik, that indeed your brothers, they want for you to, 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 to uh, you be doing a qiyam. They want you to stand up and they want you to supplicate on their behalf. He said to them, do you want to make, you want to, do you want to make that, uh, I make, make the affairs difficult for you? Do you want it for me to make the affairs difficult for you? He says, He said that because of Allah Jalla wa Allah give you good in this life and He gives you good in the hereafter and He protect you from the fire. He said, then Allah have given you all good. What more good can you want after that? You asked me to make dua in the beginning. I told you with dua. I started off with the dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. And now you asking me to make dua again when we get ready to depart. And that's, you know, if Allah grant you this dua and if He answered this dua, He grant you this, He didn't give you all good. What good do you want after that? He says that Ahmed also collected in his mushat, uh, in his mus in his musnad, when he adored Abi Adi and Hamid ibn An Thabit and on Anas, that the Messenger of Allah so risen a man. I want you to pay attention to this du'a. This is important. Pay attention to this hadith. I mean, look what he said. The Prophet so visit a man, right, from amongst the Muslims, called the Sara Mr. Lafarq, and this man was in like an um, he was like in extreme pain. Okay, I want you to pay attention. Right, he said, "Fakallahu Rasulullah wa sallam." Right? The man made a dua. He says, the Prophet says, He said, Did you ask Allah for anything? Did you supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did you make dua to him? The man said, Now, yes. He said, Yes. The dua that I made, I said, Oh Allah, Meaning, do not bring me to account whatever punishments that you have or whatever of my outcome that will happen in the hereafter. He says, don't bring me to account whatever happened in the hereafter. Actually hasten that for me in this life. Whatever you got for me that's going to be punishment or was due to me for what I've done in the Akira, don't give it to me in Akira. Give it to me now. I want to take all of that punishment now. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Subhanallah, la tutiquhu aw la tastati'uhu. The Prophet ﷺ says, Subhanallah, you are not able to bear that. If Allah was to punish you fully, you're not able to deal with it. Right? And then he says, nor are you able, he said, nor will you be able to deal with it, nor can you bear it. He says, fahalla kut. He says, so would you not say instead? Then the Prophet ﷺ told him a dua. He says, say this dua instead. <laughs> Showing you what? I want to stop here and point this out. This shows you that number one, when we make du'a, it's etiquette to making du'a. When you approach Allah Jalla wa'ala, you need to know how to approach Him. Do you understand? So the early man, they explained that the best du'a is the du'as that has been recorded. That's authentically reported from the Prophet because he knows best how to address Allah Azza wa Jalla. Not saying that you can't make du'a to Allah, but sometimes we don't know the proper etiquettes. Here is this man, he wants to make a dua, and he made a dua from himself. And the dua that he made, the Prophet says, SubhanAllah. You know, that dua is not befitting. Don't ask for that dua. This is why sometimes we need to know what we ask, and what we're asking for, and what, what, we, what do we really want. Allah is not a genie, man. Half of the stuff that you ask for, Allah already gave you. And to be honest, a lot of people don't even think about that. And that's probably deep and way over people's head. Half of the stuff that you want, that you thought inside yourself, Allah already gave it to you. This is why Allah Jalla wa'ala, he mentioned in the Quran that those who seek and want the life of this dunya, he said, we rarely give them what they already have. We give them what we rarely give them. But he said there will be no nasib, there will be no portion for them in the hereafter but the hellfire. You see? You have to understand that. Allah doesn't hold out from nobody, man. He doesn't hold out. What's decreed for you going to come to you anyway? He says, continuing this, he brings a beautiful thing before we end it. He says that hadith there, he said that the Prophet ﷺ, um, on another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was reported from a Thawri and Ibn Juraj. Kadalik said, Wara Ibn Umaja and Abi Huraira ta radi Allah ta'ala anna Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this hadith is actually, the chain for it is actually weak. He said that the Prophet ﷺ, what he used to do is, when he would go past um, the different gates or the different doors around the Kaaba, he would make this dua here. All right? If he was at the Yemeni gate or he was at the, the, the black gate, he would say, Rabbana atina fa dunya hasna wa fil akira hasma kina adab al All right? He says also has been reported from Sulaiman Ibrahim, Sulaiman, and Mujahid, and Ibn Abbas, Kala Kala Rasulullah, Ma mararatu ara ruknin, 
الركني إلا رأيت عليه ملكا يقول آمين. That the Prophet Muhammad said that it was not a gate that I passed by except that I would see an angel saying Amin to that dua. فإذا مرارتنا عليه فقولوا. So that if you pass by this particular gate or this gate, then say ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا أذاب النار. And this is what I wanted to bring today, inshallah ta'ala. The best, one of the best du'as or the frequent most du'as that the Prophet Muhammad would say is this du'a. And think about what um, Qasim ibn Abdul Rahman said and try to actually ascertain that. Let's try to get a qalban shakiran. Let's try to get a heart that is content, that is appreciative of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give it. And let's try to give what we are and in thakiran. Let's got to get a tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah jalla wa ala. And let's try to get what we call a jasadin sabiran and give a body that is, that is actually patience. Because look at Ya'qub, when the sons did what they did to Yusuf, what did he say? He said, for sabr and jameela. What did he say? He said, for rally, I'm going to express a good patience. What did Allah Jalla wa'ala say about Ayyub? He says, innahu kana sabira. That rally, he was patient. You would not find that many of the messengers and the prophets, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, strive them to be in people who have exerted patience. Because you have to understand, you have to have a heart that is free from bad thoughts and negative thoughts and negative advances of Allah Azza wa Jalla. You want to know the, the reality of life, the fiqh of life, then all you have to do is open the book of Allah and the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not going to give you a roadmap on how to be the richest man alive. Forget all that. It's not going to give you the roadmap to be rich financially. It's not going to give you that roadmap. That's not what it's going to give you. And that's not where happiness lies anyway. Because all of that stuff you're going to be tested for, you're going to be accounted for, you're going to have to use it and utilize. If not, it's going to be used against you. No, it's going to give you the roadmap to the true happiness and that is ghina and that is qana'a in your heart and the way that you're going to get that is you're going to free yourself from those negative thoughts and those negative patterns a lot of us got a lot of negative thoughts man we got a negative thought on life we got a negative thought on our lord we got a negative thought about ourselves a lot of us are stuck with self negative hatred man we really don't realize it we really do and it's, it's kind of like boggling because a person who's really knowledgeable in Islam, you would say, that can't, how can that be possible that a person can say that he's Muslim, that he's a mu'min, but yet he feel negative about himself? How? The negative way that the companions had about themselves, it wasn't negative. It was a self-accountable way. Hey, I'm not doing more. I'm falling short. I need to do this. So it was stuck between love, fear, and hope. That's why they felt that way. It wasn't the same as we. We had a negative thought, ah, this, this, this came out. And then you want people to placate you with that. I'm not placating you with that. You don't want to have that type of thought. You have Allah as the wajal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is free of all wants. Instead of you complain and do what Abu Zak do what Zakaria did. He saw Mariam, what did he do? He asked Mari, where did you get it? Huh? Ya Mariam, aina laki hada. Where did you get all of this from? She said she got it from Allah as the What did he do? Allah Jalla wa Ali says that Zakaria immediately he made dua. Rabbana. Oh my Lord, Rabbi. Oh my Lord, grant me a son. So he went straight to Allah Azza wa Jal. How you cannot do that? You, you complain and go and we open your hands. And sometimes your dua is blocked way before you even begin to ask it. Because you got a negative view. You don't have firm conviction. Okay, your sins is already blocking it. And you don't understand that any dua that you ask Allah is already answered. And it's stored away. But you don't have this type of understanding. So in your mind, you're thinking that Allah is not going to answer the dua. He already answered the dua. The Prophet Muhammad told you that in the hadith. He said, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, when you make dua, make dua with firm conviction and know that Allah has already answered the dua. And it's only going to be answered either in one or three ways. It's either Allah Jalla wa Ala is storing something up for you in the Akira, he's removing something horrible from you in this dunya, or he's going to give it to you randomly. So it already been answered. For you to sit there and think that it hasn't been answered, something is wrong. It already has been answered. You don't understand how to make the connection with your Lord. That's why we need these du'as. That's why they're important. The Prophet ﷺ didn't go here or go there. Look at his life, man. If you really want to look at his life, look at his life. He didn't have riches. He didn't have this, this, and that. But yet he was content. And look what he did. He always made du'a. When it was in war, he made du'a. When it was in times of ease, he made du'a. He always made du'a. Do you not know it? That was his comfort along with the prayer. He always made du'a. How often do we make du'a? Only when we're in a fix. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, among mankind, there are those who remember Allah only when they're horn. Only when horn touches. When touches, when messa, fa'idha messa darra, insan. If horn touches man, he lies down on his side or is standing on his, he stands up or he's on his side or this and that. And he calling and making long supplication to Allah. Only when the horn touches, that's the only time Allah is this. Only when the horn touches. Huh? 
So when all the good stuff that you have and the health and everything like that, he doesn't exist. He don't, he don't exist at that time. We're not going to praise him at that time. We're just going to remember him to get us out of the fix. And if we don't get out of the fix, then we're going to have a negative view about our Lord. Qalban shakiran. That's what he said. Whoever's been given a heart that is content. Walisan and dakiran. And you only say that which is pleases Allah. Wajasadan sabiran. And he is patient whatever calamity befalls him. This is the individual who have embodied this dua. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآكِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَكِنَا أَذَابِ النَّارِ Ameen. We ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to make us of those who say this dua frequently. And this is something that I wanted to share with everyone. Hopefully it's a benefit for myself and for you all. Whatever we said that was incorrect in our translation is definitely for ourselves and the shaitan. Whatever we said is correct is from Allah Jalla wa'ala. Subhanakallahum bihamdi. Ashhadu wa la'an. Astaghfirullah wa tubi'ilik. Jazakallah khairan.